Here is the video I've been making to mean, meaning to make, okay, there we go. I've been meaning to make for some time. You're probably wondering why I have three computers, well, I have more than three, but why I have three computers out currently, and why I'm on a dining room table. That will be explained soon. The reason why I have three computers is because I'm going to take three of them, and create two. Many months ago, without being nostalgic, or too nostalgic and then talking for 30 minutes, my family had a computer. Long story short. It was a 66 megahertz. I can't find that one. The closest one I can find is a 33. I had been working on a 25 megahertz computer, but for my purposes, it's a little bit too slow. I already have a 66 megahertz non-gateway, which I'm not going to tear apart, but that has something I need to put, this one has something I need to put into this one. I'm going to take the innards from this one and put it into this one, so it will be closer to what we had. I'm going to take the floppy drive, uh, CD-ROM drive, the five and a quarter the three and a half inch and CD ROM and put them into this one. The sound card from this one will go into here. The sound card from this one will go into here. This guy will go back into storage. These two will go back into my room. If you come around to the back, you can plainly see that this guy, oops, sorry, this guy has the Sound Blaster Pro. This guy has the Windows Sound System card. This guy has pretty much nothing. I'm planning to take the Windows Sound System from here, put it into here, put this Sound Blaster Pro 2 into here. Take this video card and keep it as is, but then take this Speedstar Pro and put it into this computer. I have the original spec sheet from the 66 megahertz um, computer here in this pamphlet. The 66 megahertz came with Windows uh, for work groups 3.1 I'm planning on upping the memory past 4 megabytes. And yeah, oh yeah, these have like all their fasteners in, so I need to remove the top all of all these and start swapping the hardware. Which, in order to open it, I will need to use my iFixit kit that I got this year for Christmas. To keep track of the fasteners, of using this patented fastener container. Totally not an applesauce container. I've gotten all the fasteners out of all of these. I just need to remove the tops now. Okay, finally got the tops off of all of them. The uh, other one is down there. And this one is extremely dusty, so I'm gonna vacuum it out. Finish up the vacuuming on this one. It's not perfect, but it'll do for now. They're the ones that have already been cleaned because they were in my collection. This guy was a newly acquired one. I guess the next thing is to um, swap the uh, drives from here and here in the hard drive. And actually put, maybe put screws on this side because these are loose. Got the floppy and hard drive assembly out of this one. Just need to do it another time. Looking at this one compared to this one, you can probably notice the difference already. These panels here need to be removed before I can put the optical drive in and the five and a quarter to just get. But one caveat. In order to get to the side screw holes, specifically go. Specifically, this one here, it's 
specifically these two down here, I will have to remove the power switch, which, not that I forgot, but I had to do that last time, I just, well, okay, I'd, I just knew I had to do it, so I'll be doing it now. For those that are wondering, or do not know, how to remove this type of switch, on the top of it, you have, and if I can point to it, get my screwdriver, you have your ground for the switch, and you have this screw, which is not related to the switch, this screw adheres the front plastic bezel. This is the screw you need to remove. After you've removed it, you take your switch, and you actually pull backwards lightly while lifting up, because there's a little metal hook here that, there's a little metal loop here that the hook on the screw attaches to. So when you remove this, you're going to have to pull back and rotate, and I don't know if you can make this out, but there's a little metal hook there that slots into that slots into that little slot there. With all of our drives removed, we can now proceed to remove the sound card which we will transfer. When removing the sound card, you just need to go and remove one itty bitty tiny screw, which I've already done that, from here, and carefully making sure not to touch too many of the electrical connections and make sure you are grounded either by touching the case beforehand or using an anti-static strap. Take the card and carefully wiggle it free from its ISA port. For fear of damaging it, I paused the camera before I continued. Here's what the removed ISA Sound Blaster 2 card looks like. We will leave um, this RAM in there because I hope it's the right kind. I brought a whole bunch of RAM. I think it's the proper flavor. Yeah, it is. Okay. So we'll just take these and transfer it over to this system here. After much finagling and bargaining with the parts, I was able to finally get this installed. So we just slide it into place. Make sure that the puppy drive lines up, and then I'll replace the screws, and then this guy will be ready to go back on the shelf. To remove the front expansion bay blank plates, and I've done one of them first so it'll be easier for you to see, you have to, and with these tabs, you have to get a flathead screwdriver and carefully pry outward. Do not use too much force or you'll break the brittle plastic. But once you've removed it, you will then see the uh, metal shield that you then simply pull outward using the plastic provided. Now once you've removed one, it will be easier to then remove the second one. If you have a vacuum cleaner handy, now would be a good time to clean dust bunnies out, or any dust caked on. The second I.O. plate just simply pulls upward and outward. Then to install the I.O. plate and blanking plate, pretty much the reverse of what I showed you. And since this is old pressed metal, it may be a little bit finicky, just try not to bend it too much. After you've inserted both of them, making sure that the top slides in and overlaps the bottom piece. Now remember folks, it's not supposed to be perfect. 
It's just to keep the electrons from, from frying your brain. After you put the metal inserts in, you can start by putting the plastic keyed inserts, like so. Making sure to line them up and, have the, and having the tab click into its respectable spot. Once you've gotten the first piece, sorry, there's some dust on it. Once you got the first piece installed, the second piece will be a cinch. And there we go. To reinstall the power switch on your Gateway 2000 46 based system, take the power cable. Snake it through there and make sure that your my flashlight make sure that your power switch has clipped in to its little slot up there. If needed you can kinda finagle it to get that little Thing down in the hole and latched. Once you have it popped into place like so, you can rotate the switch forward. And then taking your screw, which you removed, Insert it up into the screw hole there. If you have a magnetic screwdriver, now would be a perfect time to get that. Let's just line the screw up a little bit. If you have a magnetic screwdriver, now would be a perfect time to get that. You line it up in its hole. That you line it up in its hole, and then you take your screwdriver and you screw the screw in place. Being sure not to make it too tight. You just want to secure it. You're not making it earthquake proof. Ensuring that all cables are tucked down and out of the way, you can then proceed to replace the top cover. Lining it up, you will then just slide it down as shown. Once you have it secure, you can then proceed to pushing the case forward with even pressure. After you have your cover on, nice and snug, you'll just go and replace the screws. And you can put in as little or as many screws as you want. Since this is going back into the parts area, I'm just going to put in two screws on the other side. Pardon me. One screw on each side, a total of two screws. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, we can now focus on replacing the sound card. The sound card which we're going to swap is the Sound Blaster Pro 2. And we're going to swap it for the Windows Sound System card, which actually has ad lib emulation. When you go and play a game, it's detected as general MIDI slash ad lib. General MIDI for sound effects and ad lib for music.
Maybe this one would be easier to get out one-handed. Who am I kidding? I can't remove the card one-handed. So that's why I had to pause. But maybe I can put one in one-handed. So you line up the slot, making sure that the locking blank is secured. I'm pressing down evenly on both sides. Now that we have that installed, we'll just replace the screw, which is actually a Torx bit slash flathead. Putting it in, we'll just uh, hand start it and then finish with the flathead. Because I am too lazy right now to bother with the Torx. So tighten that down and then replace the cover. To replace the cover on a compact Prolinea, it's much easier than a Gateway 2000. You just have to Grab the cases so and rotate it forward. Once you've placed it on top of the computer case, make sure that the that the little guides on either side are lined up. And as you slide it back, it should pop down into place. And then you just push it together. And optionally you can secure it with a center screw there and two side screws, one here and one here. We're now down to the final stretch of part one. Part one will cover the hardware assembly and swapping of the computer. Then later on I'll do part two covering the software and configuration. We just need to take our optical, floppy, and sound card and put them into the put them into the new chassis. Because of how this RAM is inserted, you have to be extremely careful on how you both insert it and remove it. Push this out of the way. When I removed this, I had to push back two little tabs. Again, more dust. With this style of RAM, specific to not only Gateway 2000s, but computers of early 90s, late 80s, in order to insert your memory, taking the memory stick here, you have to first line up the notch here, and then you have to make sure that it fits in with this plastic clip and this plastic clip, which correspond with the hole in the side of the RAM module. So as you insert it, make sure that it lines up. You have to actually insert it angled downward, so that then, once it's seated, you push it back what happens is that the side clips pop into place and then you have it installed. Do not put excess pressure on these modules or the slot itself or you will break the retention tabs and those are very hard to both C and replace. Those are very hard to replace because you would have to unsolder the actual channel from the motherboard. And since this computer is 20 plus years old, coming up on 21 years old, actually 22 because it's a 93, coming up on 22 years old, you will probably not be able to find replacement parts for this. And also, the plastic is very brittle. 
took the liberty of doing this off camera as to save some time. But I got the optical drive installed and all the cables set up. I'm remembering more and more why I didn't put screws on both sides. This is how far I've gotten. I've only gotten four screws in. Can't really see, but believe me. I took the liberty of doing this off camera, considering how, how, how hard it was. I finally got the cables and power set up for the floppy and the optical. A few stripped screws here and there, and a damaged screwdriver. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I finally got the stuff all nice and secure. Now to just drop this guy in. After you've gotten everything all... <coughs> Sorry, I had to sneeze. It's dusty. <laughs> After you get it all situated, and then take your screws and proceed to put them in. I hope there's four screws, or I mean three. Let's see how many we have. That's two so far. Got those screws installed. I, that just leaves us the power switch. Last thing to do is to install <clears throat> our sound card. Same idea goes. You just unscrew the retention screw. This is not a sound card I'm removing. I'm removing a modem. The same idea. Then you get a firm grasp on it and you wiggle it out. Oh hey cool, I got an ISA board out with one hand. Line up your sound card or your expansion card that is. And make sure that everything is aligned. Then use two hands make sure it pops into place. Take your screw, this time it's a Phillips, it's a Phillips slash nut driver kind. Now to just pop the cover on. I almost forgot, I should probably install the video card next. Sorry I didn't film putting in that card. I just really didn't want to uh, end up damaging it. Since nothing is ever easy, I had gotten the top on, as I'd shown. I had it all buttoned up, screwed in, everything nice. And then, this has been fixed, but then I plugged in the mouse. I know there wouldn't be mouse drivers yet. And then I went to plug in the keyboard. And the keyboard is PS2. I don't know if you can see, but on PS2 style keyboard adapters, they have a little keyed piece of plastic, as you can see there that goes into the top part of the either of either port. One is for mouse, one is for keyboard. What apparently happened was whoever used this last had put the keyboard PS2 in and then probably tweaked it upward or downward or ripped it out, which broke off the little piece of plastic there, leaving it inside there. So I went to plug it in 
and it wouldn't go. It would go halfway, and it would stop, because that little piece was keeping it from going in. So I grabbed my tweezers, and I got it out halfway, and then it kept on falling it back in. So I grabbed the vacuum nozzle, and I kept the vacuum there with the tweezers, and I was able to pull it out, and it vacuumed it. Now to reassemble it and turn it on. We are ready for our first power on test. The system I took the parts out of I knew worked because I'd been using it. I just wanted a slightly faster processor and a system that was more akin to what I had as a kid. Since this is a switching power supply, I don't know if the switch is in the on position or off position. So when I plug this in, it may just start right up. That's the fan. Two pieces of news. First one is, I guess I was wrong on which charge it was in, that was in the system. I still need to configure the floppy drive and the CD-ROM and the um, diskette, the other diskette. But the um, Speedstar Pro, the Diamond Speedstar Pro that was in this was not an E-ISA, it was a regular ISA. So I'll swap it out and see if I get video now. Update on the system. <sighs> Here's what transpired. Apparently E-ISA is not backwards compatible with ISA. This only has ISA ports. So, and also this isn't the exact system. It's similar. It's not 66 megahertz and it's not the uh, desktop. Well, it's they had multiple models. So it's not the exact model. So it doesn't have E-ISA ports. And all of the ISA cards I have that are video are being taken up. So I'm using the onboard video, which seems to be okay for what I'm going to use it for. But let's show what I've been able to complete. So it turns on. Counts up. That's just a soft test beep. It counts up the memory. I, I test the floppy drives, and it boots. Also, for added, so here's high mem. And then I was able to get the CD ROM to work. And to prove that, I'll eject it to show that there's something in it. It's a totally legal copy of Windows 95. It's a backup copy. You don't have copies of Windows 95. So if we navigate to D drive, it's there and it starts to spin the drive. So let's do D directory. And here it is, it reads it. Let's do See? And it's reading off the CD. And this um, concludes the hardware section of this. I'm going to clean up all the nasties, make it nice and pretty, and then we'll start the software side tomorrow or whenever, after I pass out and take a seven hour long nap.